Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to USTA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. My name is Laura Bowen. I'm the executive director at USTA Florida. May is National Tennis Month, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate than by having a wonderful conversation with Matt Pressman, the publisher of Florida Tennis Magazine. I'm not gonna give you too much of Matt's background because he shares quite a bit of his story growing up in Connecticut, playing tennis in Florida, and eventually working in both the publication and business world. So you'll have to tune in the podcast to learn more about Matt. What I can say is that Matt is such a gift to USTA Florida and to Florida Tennis. If you haven't picked up Florida Tennis Magazine, be sure to visit their website or social media and subscribe. And of course, you'll wanna check out the July-August issue, which will be a very special commemorative edition focusing on USTA Florida's 75th anniversary. I hope you enjoy this episode of the podcast. You can always leave comments and questions on our social media accounts. And for all episodes of the Here to Serve podcast, visit ustaflorida.com slash here to serve. Matt, welcome to the Here to Serve podcast. It is so exciting to have you with me here today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm super excited to talk to Laura today and to everyone in the USCA Florida community. I'm really looking forward to it and I just appreciate and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure. We'll have you back again, I'm sure. So <laughs> this will <laughs> consider this part one of the, the introduction to Matt Preston, but Very I want I wanted to start sort of just kind of at the beginning of telling us a little bit about where you grew up and how you first got interested in tennis. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Milford, Connecticut. So I, I'm a Connecticut guy. I, uh, you know, spent my childhood in Connecticut and we belong to like a little kind of uh, pool, you know, club. It wasn't really like a country club. It was just like a little pool, you know, that we belong to. <laughs> when I was young and there happened to be some few tennis courts there and a big wall. And so as a little kid, my dad used to just say, you know, hey, go over there. Here's my tennis racket, just hit against the wall. I, I, I've got to do some stuff and we're running around and meeting some friends or whatever. But back in those days, they just let kids kind of yes. go and run wild. It was a crazy different time. And so I hit against the wall, really liked it. And the tennis pro came over to me and said, hey, you're you're pretty good. And 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 invited me to a group lesson free of charge and just said, I'd like you to hit with these kids. They're all, you know, I was six at the time. Okay. These kids were all 12. And he said, I think you can probably hit with them. And so I, you know, it was like, this is awesome. I was like, sure. You know, I was a little six year old kid. I went on the court with them and then I started to hit winners and I started to shine as like the best kid on the court at six. And the pro took a real interest in me and just said, I think you're, you got something special. It was the first thing in my life and probably the last thing that I was incredibly <laughs> talented in and just, just found like a real like affinity for it. And uh, that's how it all got started was just, you know, a pro recognizing some talent in me. And that got me kind of, you know, started in tennis. There's so many themes in that that I really love. First, your dad encouraging you to like take his racket and go hit. I mean, so oftentimes we see kids get into sports because of their parents. The fact that you had somebody who took an interest in you and, and let you play for free, right? So you could get interested in it with, and the fact that you were playing with these, these kids that you know, it sounded like they didn't mind that they had a six-year-old in there. I have an older brother and he would have hated playing anything with me when I was a kid. So you had these these special ingredients there. And of course you had a, a place to play. And um, I love that story because it touches on all of the wonderful things that we see when people come into our sport that we try to encourage. Yeah. And I, I was very fortunate in the fact that we had a weird setup in my house. So we had a single car garage and next to that single car garage was a concrete wall. And so I would go every day after school by myself and just hit against the wall. For, you had your own wall. For hours on end, like this little kid, everybody else would go play and I would just hit against the wall and pretend I was, you know, John McEnroe or Bjorn Borg and, 
And I was like, you know, in my own little world as a little kid pretending I'm a pro tennis player. And I think hitting against that wall for hours on end really helped develop my game as a, as a youngster. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then my dad started to take interest when he saw that the pro was interested and I was interested in playing against the wall. And he entered me into some USDA tournaments. And so when I start to win those tournaments, then suddenly said, oh, wow, my son's actually a pretty good player. And that's really what kind of lit the fire in me was the USTA um, and winning those tournaments. Those little trophies as a little mm-hmm. kid were like incredible, especially in the 12 and unders, yeah. you know, as a, as a young kid. And so that's, you know, how kind of part luck and then part circumstance that kind of got me really deeply involved in tennis at a young age. Awesome. Well, I want to ask about your other passion. You said that that was probably the first and last thing that you were good at, but I disagree. You're a very good writer and communicator, and we're very fortunate that (laughs) we have you in our tennis ecosystem. So I wanted to ask you, you know, you're, you're editing a magazine. Did you always enjoy writing and editing? Is that something that you enjoyed as a young person or did you pick that up later in life and really have a passion for it later? Yeah, it was a really interesting thing. So both my parents are authors. Um, My father wrote the largest selling textbook in the world on software engineering. So very, very serious author, 20 editions all over the world. Uh, My mother's also an author. So writing runs in the family. Uh, I was in love with magazines. Obviously, Tennis Magazine was my favorite, World Tennis. I mean, I, I was just a subscriber to all the tennis magazines and hoped to get into magazines after college. Um, I did get into magazines immediately, but on the business side. So I was, I was on the other side of the uh, of, of the sort of aisle, so to say, mm-hmm. in magazines and worked all through my 20s in magazines, mostly music magazines. Um uh, I worked at Vibe magazine with Quincy Jones, which was pretty cool. Um, I worked at a fashion magazine called Details. I also worked at Men's Fitness magazine, given my fitness background and, and, and athletic background. Um, eventually, I found my way into launching an ad agency. And I launched it with some other folks in the magazine industry because we felt like there wasn't a good agency out there that addressed sort of youth culture and sort of cool influencers in the music space. And so we launched this agency called Project 2050. Um, One of the cool things about it was I was able to get this creative director that was one of the world's most famous street artists named Shepard Ferry. So you may know Shepard Ferry. Remember the Obama uh, Hope poster that was mm-hmm. everywhere? Yes. Yeah. That incredible, like iconic artwork. You've probably seen it all over the place. Mm-hmm. That was him. So he okay. did that. Um, he also did ad campaigns for Nike and Sprite and Coca-Cola. And he did album covers for Billy Idol and Black Eyed Peas. Oh, wow. So I was, it was a real amazing thing. I was able to get him through some connections to come into the agency. Now, he was an incredible artist, but that left as a small startup someone had to write the copy for all the advertising yeah. and that was being me. So, yeah, so, so that was how I got started. And then my next business was uh, doing aftermarket parts and accessories for Tesla owners in the electric vehicle space. Okay. And I started a blog uh, related to clean energy, solar, electric cars, Tesla, and, and what have you. That became wildly successful. Um, Lots of eyeballs came into our site and uh, other media outlets wanted to pick up my stories. And so it and then I got a newsletter and an email newsletter that wound up quickly getting 60,000 subscribers. And I was like, wow, this writing thing may be uh, something I'm at least decent enough where I can be more interested in it. So. So the writing thing, I appreciate you giving me some kudos on it, because I don't think I'll ever reach the level my parents have as authors. But you know, certainly something I, I love to do. I really lo- love writing. And, um, and and I know you're you you were a journalist as well. Or, yeah, or, or, I mean, that mm-hmm. is a love that I, I say softball was my first love. I grew up kind of like you across the street from a softball park. And that I always tell people that was my first love when I was five. My second love is writing in books. And it's like it was something I don't get to do as much in my job now, but I enjoyed a, a lovely career writing and not nearly as good as your parents. If I write one book someday, I'll consider that a life achievement. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it is it is a joy that I have and and certainly appreciate 
your background. I actually uh, wanted to ask you when you mentioned Vibe, and I knew that from your bio, I was watching recently, there was a docu-series on Essence magazine. I don't know if you've seen it, but what's interesting about it, and maybe this will tie to some of our comments about tennis and magazines, is that they talked about when Essence started to decline, like one of the things they weren't doing was recruiting younger readers. And what they said is that magazines like Vibe were doing a much better job of entering that space and serving more of like a young hip demographic. And so it was kind of an interesting window into the magazine world and pop culture from, you know, the the nineties and the two thousands and kind of what happens in that magazine space, which greatly fascinates me as an, as an industry and how it's ever changing. And compared to tennis, I feel like, I feel like the magazine and the communications world just moves so much faster. And tennis is sort of like this <laughs> kind of sits in its own space for a hot minute. So that must be a really interesting marriage. It is a really interesting thing. And I mean, I, yeah, I loved Essence magazine and I, I loved all magazines in our space and, 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 and you know, surrounding sort of the, the content that we had at Vibe. I also had Vibe bought a magazine called Spin, which was about alternative rock. So I was sort of the designated yeah, guy to work with Spin magazine and, mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody from Nirvana to Pearl Jam to, you know, you name it. I mean, it was was a part of Spin. And on the flip side, you had a lot of hip-hop artists and R&B artists and soul artists and vibe. And, uh, you know, I mean, I got very lucky in magazines. My first boss was the son of Anna Wintour, who was the... Uh, oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. The editor of Vogue. Yeah. Yes. Like, incredible. And so, and so the crazy story... Tying it back to tennis, kind of interesting is that 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 Sam, uh, Anna's uh, uh, son, um, invited me over to his his apartment in New York City, and so I went over to their place, and I remember walking by like a Picasso, and he said, "This is a Picasso." So oh, that's cool. Did you get? And it was a real Picasso. It wasn't like a like a screen print. And I was like, "Wow, his mom must be a big guy." I didn't even know, you know, I didn't really. Oh, you didn't him. know at the time. That's funny. You know, I'm a typical like guy, you know, athlete, and I was I didn't know Vogue, you know, <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, I of course knew Vogue." And so, so I met Anna Wintour, and she, you know, and she immediately warmed up to me because she's famously cold with everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when she heard I was a tennis player and I played in college. And, you know, was was on track to go pro. She just was like, oh, my God, tell me all about, you know, how you play tennis and who you know and how you went through training at Academy. I mean, she was really into it. It was kind of cool. But, uh, yeah, I mean, even speaking briefly with her and being at Details, which is a big fashion magazine, the men's category under Condé Nast, um, I realized that you have to be young. You have to be kind of like in the culture of what young people really appreciate. And so... Um, I felt it was important when I launched an agency to hire someone like Shepard Ferry, who had worked in kind of street art and kind of with different musicians and different artists to make sure that um, I could put brands in touch with that kind of culture. And so I agree. I think it's important for all companies to make sure that they refresh themselves continually to stay young. I agree. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, in tennis, we sort of are going through a little bit of that. I love here when we have new young talent that come in and a lot of times they've not been exposed to tennis before, but they bring this other world of like what's trending and what's cool and what's happening in the world. And we think of like, OK, how can you mash up that with what we do here? And it does keep us more innovative like the more young fresh different minds we bring in so that definitely resonates with me and I so appreciate that about about you you're so open to different ideas thoughts so you know certainly that's something that is much needed in our industry I think (laughs) very cool yeah it's funny because I look at tennis you know I was obviously deeply involved as a junior I played in college and then I, I sort of abandoned the sport and then um, I had a very severe shoulder injury, rotator cuff that kind of basically, you know, told me you're not going to go pro. You just can't because the injury is too bad. And so I then, you know, dived fully into the magazine industry and, you know, New York City and just sort of put my head down and worked as hard as I could. Um, and then really didn't pick up tennis again until more recently. 
Um, but now coming back to tennis with the experience that I've uh, accumulated in other worlds, it's kind of interesting to see tennis again and then sort of think, you know, how fun it would be to sort of bring some of that vibrancy and that youth culture back to the sport. I think it'd be cool. Well, let's talk about tennis a little bit more. I'm super curious what brought you to Florida, because we've yep. talked about your background in Connecticut and New York. And when did you first read Florida Tennis? Yeah, so so what, so let's let's back up a little bit. Um, like, why am I even interested in Florida tennis, or even know about Florida tennis? Mm -hmm. I'm a Connecticut guy in the snow, you know, up in New England. <laughs> so I, so I, you know, I became a pretty uh, decent junior tennis player in New England, and and, and became ranked, and um, and was doing pretty well. And my, you know. My team won the Connecticut State Championship. I, I got hooked up with Brian Barker, who was the coach of James Blake, who eventually got to number four in the world. He's the tournament director of the Miami Open and, you know, a major personality. Before James Blake was the kid in Connecticut, it was me, believe it or not. So, so and I hit with James when he was a, when he was a really young guy. It was just really kind of crazy because Brian was working with him. But, you know, after training with Brian, there was some recognition that I might be best served to go to an academy, either Nick Boletari's Academy or Harry Hobman. At the time, they were the two big academies, mm -hmm. both in Florida. Uh, obviously, Boletari, now ING Academies in Bradenton, but uh, Hopman was based uh, right outside Tampa and Wesley Chapel. So my folks, you know, decided, hey, listen, we're going to send you down in your junior year in high school, and you're going to go and live on your own, you know, at five, 15 or 16 years old in a dorm and just play tennis for five hours a day. That's what it was back then. It was really hardcore, a lot of tennis. And then they also have an hour of fitness afterwards. Um, so I was kind of like winning left and right in Connecticut. Then I came down to Florida and all of a sudden I started playing tournaments in Florida and realizing, hey, I'm not winning. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like Florida tennis is serious, man. It, the, the talent down here is incredible. And so I always had this thing as a junior player of realizing that Florida was the place to be for tennis. And I kind of went back to Connecticut with my tail between my legs, like, <laughs> maybe I'm not as good as I think I am, you know? Um, but I was good enough to get a D1 scholarship at UConn, and I became captain at UConn, and, 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 and you know, and, and, you know, may have been able to play some, at the time they called it satellites, which is now called challengers, yeah. you know, and my doubles partner at UConn did wind up going on to play satellite uh, pro, pro tennis. Um, but, but in any event, that, so my first interaction with Florida tennis was through the academy world. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. fast, fast forward to 2012. 2012 comes and I get married. I have a baby, uh, my, my baby girl, Maya. Um, and we decide to leave New York City and move down to Florida, to Delray Beach. And so, you know, got back down to Florida uh, like any dad was doting on my daughter nonstop and was just, you know, um, part of that as she grew and became a toddler was, you know, not sleeping at all. <laughs> and then, you know, and then realizing, oh my God, I just got to quickly get food. And so it was going to McDonald's and, you know, Burger King and <laughs> eating terrible. And I put on Laura, like 60 pounds and my, oh, my old, um, my old doubles partner was like, listen, you know, you got to get back in shape, man. You're looking like you got the dad bod, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you need to get the tennis like, bod back. You, you got to get that bod tennis bod back, tennis right? <laughs> Crazy. So he was just like, you got to just hit some balls. I mean, man, you're, so, you know, I used to love playing tennis and you don't play anymore and your shoulder injury is long gone now. Just try. And I said, you know what? You're right. I, I'd rather do that than go to the gym. So I started playing again with him a bit and then started to play with some local pros and started beating them. And I started realizing, oh, my God, like I, I didn't really lose as much as I thought I did. I still have this this knack for tennis. And then I got hooked again. I realized like tennis, it, I got addicted to the sport again. I couldn't play enough. I started playing turn USC, USA tournaments. You know, um, I started to really get deeply into the world of tennis again, but I didn't know anything about Florida. So I, everywhere I went, every pro shop, every country club, every tournament, um, every tennis retailer, uh, I kept seeing Florida tennis everywhere. And so I kept picking up the magazine. And I decided to subscribe 
And uh, that's how I first found Florida Tennis was just through the Florida Tennis scene. I would read it cover to cover. And then I'd figure out, okay, oh, these are the cool academies. Maybe I'll try to hit with a pro there. These are the big tournaments. Um, these are the big locations where there are big facilities for tennis here, at least in South Florida. And um, it plugged me into the scene. And it was an incredible way for me to get like super enthusiastic and excited about tennis again. And it became like, I, used, I call it my path to paradise. It was like my, my ultimate dream was being fulfilled by this magazine. And so, um, so anyway, that's how I got back into tennis and how I found Florida again. And, and it was a really kind of a wild story, you know? Well, like you a, came to a great place in Delray. I mean, obviously uh, Delray is such a special place, not just because the Delray Beach Open is there now, but obviously, the Lipton originated there at Lavers back in the day. I mean, Del Rey is sort of like this story location and now Coco Golf, you know, being from there. I mean, there's just a certain magic. So I feel like things happen for a reason. So I'm super happy that you ended up in Del Rey because you were in a great place for tennis and for Florida tennis. And then, of course, I, I don't think there's a better uh, a better way to be plugged in than through Florida Tennis Magazine and that kind of brings me to my next question, which is, um, you know, we love Jim Martz. Jim Martz yeah. was sort of the heartbeat of Florida tennis. Um, you know, so, so sad that he's not with us, but sh oh, how grateful are we that we had Jim here first at the Herald and then, you know, doing this work for us for so long. How did you meet Jim and can you share some of your relationship that you and Jim shared? So, so it was kind of cool. So I first called Jim to subscribe to the magazine. We had a great conversation and I told him that, you know, look, I'm a magazine guy. I spent my entire twenties in magazines and I really appreciate good writing. And I was just blown away by what a good writer he was. I mean, and just said, look, you know, I, I, I just have tremendous admiration for uh, how you're handling uh, covering the sport of tennis. You know, I've been a fan of tennis, been reading magazines since I was a kid, worked in the industry. And so I feel like I have a good sense of when you, you have a great magazine. And so I told him that he was very appreciative and we had a great conversation and that was it. And I just was a subscriber for many years. And then um, I got into a situation where my business, the Tesla business I mentioned briefly before, um, uh, was acquired by another company and I was looking to get into a new business. And so I approached Jim. I just said, hey, would you like to grab lunch? I have kind of a crazy, you know, kind of uh, request of you, if you don't mind. So sure, it'd be great. Come on down, we'll grab lunch. And, 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 and you know, and, and, and that was it. And it was just a subscriber, I didn't, you know, and I just wanted to explore the opportunity of working with him in some capacity at Florida Tennis. And, um, and you know, one thing led to another and we were together, you know. And so um, Florida Tennis uh, was really Jim's brainchild and, and had his spirit, his soul and his vision so tied to how the magazine was and how good it was. And so uh, as we worked together, he was the editor and I worked more on the business side of the magazine. And, um, you know, ultimately, uh, Jim took me on as almost like a, and a mentor and almost like a father figure, really. I mean, he was just an incredible individual to be around, so connected, so networked with everybody in the industry, an impeccable rec reputation. Every tournament we went to, everyone knew him, everyone wanted to talk to him, every pro. I mean, it was incredible. And so he'd introduce me and, I, you know, who's this guy? He's kind of tacky. He's <laughs> like, you know, you're... And I was like, I'm, I'm kind of Jim's intern, you know, and, yes. always, and so, yeah, you know, he was just thought it was funny. And so, and so, but that really was what I was, it was like his intern, you know, just like, I just was a sponge trying to get as much information as I could. Um, and so, yeah, so that was our relationship. And, um, you know, really what Jim taught me, I think the big thing was Jim taught me to, to chase your dreams, you know, and to, to follow your passion and, you know, and so it was just so cool to be around someone who had covered tennis at the Herald, had the the moxie, if you will, to jump out and do his own magazine and, and make it, you know, a magazine that's been around for 30 plus years. It's incredible in our industry. I mean, for, for in the publishing 
yeah. world that's that's an amazing feat so um yeah so i miss him dearly um and you know hopefully some of the incredible lessons that he taught me rubbed off and and can continue in the legacy uh, of florida tennis they absolutely did and i know people will say that i'm biased and they're right but i will say florida tennis is is the benchmark for um magazines and tennis and i know they're dwindling but i will tell you that it is the magazine that i read cover to cover and i feel that like you said you know just that the amount of coverage and the just the caliber of the coverage that's in there yeah you can't get that anywhere else i mean you just can't even even with us we're not interviewing tommy paul and like you know that's not what we do on this side of the house and so it's such a wonderful representation of the full gamut of Florida tennis, but also right. of tennis. Like you said, I mean, I feel like Florida continues to be that epicenter for tennis. And so if you want to know what the heartbeat of tennis is like, you read Florida Tennis Magazine and you've continued that tradition and that a caliber of, of a content beautifully. And, I, and I'm not just saying that. I know Jim obviously said that he felt that way it was his baby you don't just hand your baby to anybody so right. the fact that you know he chose you and you were able to sort of take that baby and care and feed it and now it's you know maybe it's a teenager now I don't know it's a, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you've you've done some wonderful things with the magazine and you know obviously we had a relationship with Jim for many years and we've worked with him and you know, when you came on, there were some um, initial changes that you made, which were really exciting visually to it. So can you maybe share a little bit from the time that you've taken over Florida Tennis, maybe what have been some of the biggest challenges? And then what do you view as the biggest successes in terms of what you've been able to bring to the magazine? Yeah, well, to, to, to back up a bit to your first point, which is a, which is a good one. Um, well, to even back up further, the cool thing is, yeah, Tommy Paul, Francis Tiafo, both live in Boca Raton, where I live now. Um, you know, Jessica Bagula, I saw her at Dunkin' Donuts the other day. <laughs> it's like, you know, she's here in Boca Raton. Dunkin' yeah, people well, are my people, Jess. So yeah, I'm just yeah, going to tell you, if you're yeah. a Dunkin' person, I, I have lo much love for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's like, you know, and then you got Taylor Fritz down in Miami. sabalanka has got a place in Miami. I mean, it's, it's amazing how many pros live here. It's just incredible, yes. you know. And so, yeah, I, that, that's really great that you, that, that you, you know, you see and you recognize all, all the excitement, you know, going on in the pro game, at least in, in terms of Florida players, but which we like to cover in addition to a lot of other things. But yeah, I mean, one thing that Jim and I really shared was just a passion for the game. And I think, and, and for good writing and, 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 and great coverage in the, in, in the tennis space, you know, both of us are strong believers that, you know, positivity, uh, is something that's much needed in the media and inspiration is much needed in the media. The media is a place that um, doesn't necessarily do the best job of creating inspiring, um, exciting uh, stories that that are positive and uplifting. And so that's something that I've always been a big believer in. I'm, 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 I'm big on that. And so is Jim. Um, and so what Jim really, you know, appreciated or I guess was interested with me in was the fact that I brought this sort of youth more youthful bent to my my views on on how tennis can can be reinvigorated let's say with with some with some really cool graphic design some really impressive and ex exciting visuals um covering the game uh from the junior level up to the pro level um, just bringing sort of a, a, an exciting digital component into the game, you know, doing a newsletter every email, uh, really redesigning and, and creating a brand new website, um, you know, and, and just just you know having a bigger presence on social media. He just he just for him, he was just print, and, and he said, "Listen, I've always wanted to get into these these other areas. It's just that you know I'm I'm closing in on 80 years old, and it's just not my yeah. cup of tea, you know." So. Yeah. But it'd be wonderful if we can do that. And so that was one of my big sort of initiatives getting into the into the game. So in terms of challenges, obviously the big challenge and 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 you know also heartbreak for me was 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 Jim passing recently, yeah. right? Because that presented a um a really serious uh situation at the beginning of the year that that I had to sort of scramble and just figure things out, you know, and this is what it's about 
in any business, like, you, you know, you, you have to be able to bounce back from, from uh, challenges and you have to be able to just pull the bootstraps, you know, and it just, and just make it work. And so that's what we've done over the last few issues and, 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 um, and, and we're continuing to, you know, sort of, you know, kind of deal with uh, the fact that there's, there's just now more uh, on my plate, frankly, you know, yeah. it, to, to get after, I just got to get after it, you know, and that's what I try to do the best I can with um, in terms of, things that I'm really excited about, you know, obviously what you pointed out is just really cool design and a really cool digital presence that's growing, which is fun. Uh, and then, you know, working with different companies and getting deeper into the industry. One good example, the Miami Open, like we've, we've forged a really great relationship with the Miami Open, um, which you're going to see in this issue, which I'm showing for the first time anywhere on this podcast. Yes, Danielle! Yeah, this is a yes. this is a what they call proof. It's not really the issue yet, but it's. I love uh, it. I yeah, love it. I love it. So, so you got the scoop on this. Uh, so probably before anybody uh, sees it, but uh, yeah. So you know we've done a lot with the Miami Open, and can want to continue to do more with ING and the and, and the Miami Open in the future. Uh, we did a lot with the Delray Beach Open. That was really exciting, and of course our relationship with USTA Florida, which is incredible. And 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 you know one thing I think that really shines in this magazine is. The fact that the team at USTA Florida does such a wonderful job of covering tennis um, through the news and the newsletter that you guys do, mm -hmm. that oftentimes on our website, we pick up stories from USTA Florida because they're just so good. I mean, you know, so that's it's just a compliment to how good the coverage is and the fact that you guys have a six page special section in each issue that I think is just amazing. And so it's, it's to me, it was really interesting when I heard you speak recently and found out that you had a journalism background or training or where it yeah. was an interest for you because I said, oh, that's where it comes from. You know? <laughs> that's why it's important. Like, why is it so good? It's just, you know, it doesn't seem like something. And so that, so that's where that comes from. So I love the relationship we have. Um, I think we're doing some really exciting stuff in the next issue, obviously the 75th anniversary, yes. uh, some of which we can probably reveal. I don't know how much we want to reveal here. I can let you either either do it or not but but there's some very cool things yeah. just to get people excited the next issue is going to be amazing and it's one of the most exciting and uh, amazing issues florida tennis has ever done and so I um uh i just am super enthusiastic about it so that is for me probably the coolest thing we're doing this year and i i love that you know we had taught i actually think i have a copy of it here on my desk so um when our 75th anniversary came around, one of the first things that, you know, I had here in the office and somebody had brought it to me was there was a book that was done yeah. for our 50th. And, um, you know, we obviously know who wrote this book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one person that could write this book. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when we were thinking about would we do a book again, we actually did think about that. And one of the things we thought about was the lens of how the landscape has changed, right? And we wanted to really make sure that if we invested in something, that it wasn't duplicative of what we already did, but also that everybody would want to pick it up and have it. Yeah. And we talked about it. We talked about a coffee table book with images. We talked about a lot of things. And when it came down to it, we said, you know what? Everyone reads Florida Tennis. Why wouldn't we do a special issue of Florida Tennis that really commemorates and people could keep it as a way to say, this was, it's almost like a moment in time of the 75th year of all the things that we were doing. And, you know, we do have an amazing team here. Uh, I have to say our team in the marketing and communication side is wonderful. You know, yeah. selfishly, I'm excited that I get to write a couple of things for this issue because I don't get to do that very often anymore. And so I get to turn that side of my brain back on and say, okay, I want to write these articles. And for the first time, um, you know, we're also looking at putting out a report on the state of Florida tennis, which we've something we've never done before either. So you're going to get an article on that. So that's something I feel pretty comfortable previewing is that for a long time, we've had sort of snippets of data, but we haven't really ever compiled something that says, 
based on all the information that we see, hear, feel, touch, and it's not everything. There's a lot of parts of our game we don't, we don't, you're not the authority on. But the pieces that we are to say, really want to take a look at where we are today. And then, of course, you know, give a preview of where we're going in the future. And I think Jarrett's been working with you on the outline for the magazine. There's some other cool things that I know um, articles in there that are more national focused, you know, things like um, the tour. Uh, So some of those things will be, I think, very, very interesting to the reader. So I'll put it, I'll put a plug in for it to make sure that um, you pick up that. It's the, is it the June, July or July, August? I can't remember. Uh, it's July, August. Yeah. July, August issue yeah. will be July, a special August. issue. Yeah. 75th yeah. anniversary. And we're, we're super excited. So thank you for letting us kind of take it on. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, this is really cool. So we have two scoops here. We have a uh, look at the Danielle Collins cover. No one's I love that. it. And none of our readers, by the way, Florida Tennis, know that that next issue is going to be all dedicated to USTA Florida 75th anniversary. So this is also a scoop. I didn't know if Laura wanted to talk about it. No, I do think it's exciting. And, you know, hopefully they'll fly off the shelves and, um, you know, we people will keep them for the future. And certainly we'll be looking to give them out at future events as well. So um, you might want to do an extra print run for this one because I think you might get some new. For sure, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of new content in there. And um, like I said, the team's been working very, very hard on it. Um, So thank you for giving us um, all of the support and and your help with it because it wouldn't happen without you. We we don't have the ability to put it together ourselves and you. Well, I can't wait to read your articles. That's very exciting. It'd be cool to read your articles and also um, just really what I've seen thus far makes me extremely excited. So I don't want to give away too much, but I'll tell you this: it's it's going to be a really cool issue. And I think I I agree with you. I think we got to do a lot extra print run because. There are certain issues that become collector's editions and they they sell out. And, you know, this this I think will be one of them. So, yeah. You know, Adam Russell went 50 copies of it for <laughs> like future set signatures. So. There, <laughs> you can already autographs know. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I agree. Well, since you showed us the Danielle Collins issue, I did want to ask, you know, for me, when I see like you know, what's happening with Tommy Paul and the great run that he's having right now. Danielle Collins winning Miami Open, Coco Golf U.S. Open champion. When I think of Florida tennis and exciting things happening, I think of the pro side of the house, but I actually think more about all the energy that I'm getting from, you know, cities and municipalities around, can you help us deliver more programs, build more tennis courts. That excites me. It's it's more than we can handle right now because there's so much excitement and energy at the grassroots level. So those two things excite me yeah. most. But I'm curious for you, what are the most exciting things that you see happening in Florida tennis right now? Well, I, th- I look at Florida tennis, obviously, through the lens of a junior who played here and just you know, got schooled <laughs> and uh, and got a lot better, by the way, and and kind of, you know, then, then took that improvement and uh, and was able to play college tennis and, and the like. But like, you know, I couldn't believe how good it was down here. Now I feel like it's even better. I mean, it, the the talent here in Florida is just it's, it's unparalleled, I think, anywhere in the world, uh, especially for junior tennis. Um, to me, Florida is the crown jewel of American tennis, right? So it's, 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 it is the place, if you're a tennis player and you don't live in Florida, you, you're just at a big disadvantage. And I know this from being Connecticut. I mean, there is no state that brings it like Florida tennis, you know? So um, there's a lot of things that excite me about what I'm seeing in Florida. Um, I am very excited about uh, the level at, so we talk about the pros, you know, obviously there's incredible number of pros that live here and, you know, I mean, right in our backyard here in South Florida, there's a, there's a, there's a whole lot of them. Danielle Collins, obviously up in St. Pete. Um, you, you've got players all over the state. Um, but, but to me, really, I think junior tennis is, is very exciting. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was, you know, Two days ago, I went to Rick Macy Academy, right? So Rick Macy trains, uh, you know, obviously trained Andy Roddick. He trained the Williams sisters. He was in the movie King Richard. He was portrayed in one movie. Um, 
you know, Canon, on and on and on. And I, I hit with an eight-year-old girl that just won the Little Mo tournament, which is in, in uh, Palm Beach Gardens. So you're probably familiar with the Little Mo, obviously. Yeah. And that's a big tournament. That's like the sort of future. Coco Golf won that. Yes. Um, she's eight years old from the Ukraine. And she's got a scholarship to play at Macy. And so, you know, we did an interview and, you know, I, I don't want to give away the story. It's pretty amazing. And um, it was just a fascinating story. Really cool kid. She's super young. She's eight and she's just loves tennis. Right. And so she won the little Mo. She's played four tournaments so far, won every single one of them. Uh, and keep in mind, these are she's eight years old and she's winning 12 and under tournaments yeah. in Florida, where the talent yeah. is just immense. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Rick said, do you want to hit a few balls with her? And I'm like, OK, you know, sure. <laughs> so I get on the court with her and like any former teaching price to teach at country clubs and, you know, all through college. That's how I sort of made money when I was when I was coming home for the summer. I was like, OK, I'll, I'll hit it like 60 percent because she's little and she's, you know, I just want to make sure she can rally with me. <laughs> within, within five shots, Laura, I'm like, no, no, no. I no, got to go all out. As I can. She's not good, right? <laughs> And she was incredible. I mean, it was just amazing. It was like a little Agassiz. I mean, she was up on the baseline, ripping balls left and right, had me in a full sweat in like five minutes. <laughs> um, but it was so much fun hitting with her. And, and just to see the level, man, it was just incredible. And we've covered other, other uh, there's a girl, Akasha Yorobo, um, who is uh, in the plantation area just played her first tournament, um, a pro tournament, I think it was a $60,000 uh, purse uh, uh, up in um, near Saddlebrook. Mm -hmm. uh, she played up there and she, she was at Sarah Vandenberg. She played at yeah, Vandenberg. Sarah Vandenberg, yeah. exactly, yeah. and won that tournament. Mm -hmm. So just to yep. give you, so here's a girl, last year I followed her as a junior, went to see her at the US Open Juniors, blown away by her game, serve and volley are very rare to see that as a young player uh, and she just won her first pro tournament, you know, with a $60,000 purse up at Sarah Vandenberg. So it's like, you know, my God, like the talent down here is incredible. So I can't say enough good things about Florida tennis. Obviously I love the Delray beach open. I love the Miami open. Um, I love the Sarasota open, which is, which is a really cool kind of challenger. Um, and I loved obviously going to the Billie Jean King cup and seeing, seeing everybody up at the USDA and USDA Florida recently but, you know, for me, it's just, you know, I'm kind of like in my happy place covering tennis. It's the coolest thing ever, especially in Florida. We yeah. want you to stay forever. So <laughs> um, if you're in your happy place, we're happy. Uh, before we close, you know, just wanted to open it up and say, is there anything else, either about Florida Tennis Magazine or you that you think would be interesting or you'd want to share with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, uh, as a, you know, obviously lifelong tennis player, uh, you know, serious junior college player, now playing some senior tournaments, and then obviously in the, in the tennis space through, through the media uh, outlet, Florida Tennis, um, I can tell you that me getting back into playing tournaments as a, as a senior player, and even as a junior, you know, USTA and USTA Florida specifically for me, getting back into it down here in Florida has been an incredible resource. And I think every Florida tennis fan uh, should be going on the USTA Florida's uh, website, you know, following them on social media, getting their newsletter, which is amazing, by the way. Friday and, e News, so you can yeah. sign up on our website. It's it's a wonderful digest of what we have going on here. I agree. I mean, Rick Vox started that years and years ago. It's his legacy. We've done our best to improve on it. And yes, I agree. We, I tell people that all the time. Our board members say that. When people say, I don't know what's happening, like get the weekly e-news, yeah. listen to the podcast and read Florida Tennis Magazine and you'll know right. everything that's happening in Florida. <laughs> right. And, and and obviously watch this podcast, you know, but, but you know, so, so and there's so many great ways that USA Florida gets the word out. So kudos to you and to the team there. Um, and also just to play tennis, play leagues, play tournaments. I mean, it's just so much fun. I love it. Um, I'm, I'm still a, obviously a, a player. I came up for the Billie Jean King Cup and everybody's laughing. It's like every morning I'm playing you know, as much as I can at like seven in the morning. Uh, I, I just am like a, a serious tennis junkie. And, and if you are, 
uh, a big tennis fan at any level, you should be engaging with USTA Florida. So that's, that's number one. Uh, for, for those uh, listeners who are coming in from the Florida tennis side, I just very much recommend that. And obviously, if you're, if you're uh, 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 new to Florida tennis, um, I would recommend that you come in and, you know, check out our website. Uh, we, we have news uh, Monday through Friday, so daily news on the website. Um, we also have our own newsletter, which we try to complement sort of what USTA Florida does with, with different types of content. And so I feel like between the two sort of entities, we really cover, you know, 360 degrees, everything that's happening in the state. Um, and, and so that's a really neat way to sort of make sure that you're in the know as well as our newsletter. And obviously follow us on social media. Um, I'm beginning to do some, some things on YouTube myself, uh, which, which are kind of fun as well. And, and you know, it'd be so fun it's talking to Laura. I'm sure I'm going to have her on when I start to do some, some things uh, for Florida tennis like, more seriously. I like being the YouTube. question asker, not the question answer. People have <laughs> found this out about me is that, you know, there's not many times where it, it's a role reversal. Very rarely. I mean, if someone asks me, I'll do it. But uh, I try to, you know, for me, I said this to someone recently. I said, you know, if I've done anything, I, I think that I've tried to put the bright lights on the people who are doing the work to grow tennis in this state. It's, it's I'm not growing the tennis you are. And my job is to provide the resources and the support and the amplification of the work that's being done out there. So, you know, that's where I see hopefully my, my value add, but of course, you know, anything for Florida tennis magazine and, you're just such a gift to the sport in general. I mean, we're, we're very lucky you're in Florida, but you're a gift to, to all of tennis and anything that we can wow. continue to do to support. And I will say that I, you know, I, cause I like the stuff on your social media, you'll see me interact on there. Um, I read it. I look at it all the time because there are lots of things you do that I learn from and I'm like, oh, that's happening or oh, that's happening or oh, they interviewed this person. And so it's it actually does complement a lot of the things that um, we do. So, yeah, I love what you do. And I think you do a great job of of putting information out there that is really vital to our work. Oh, thanks. And I want to thank you, obviously, in USTA Florida for being uh, so supportive and, and just, you know, doing what you do, just really, you know, helping Florida tennis players engage with the sport on every level um, and just play more tennis. I mean, look, we see the studies. It's like you'll put, put a decade on your life. You know, people right. are changing their diet and doing all these crazy things to try to, you know, be healthier. And it's just play tennis. It's, it, That's it's what you did, thing. right? Your story yeah. is great. Yeah, you know, I mean, myself, I lost 60 pounds, you know, as, as a dad, just just by by hitting some balls, you know. So it's it's an amazing thing playing tennis, and I, I love what USTA Florida does, and uh, and, and just appreciate uh, what you guys do on every level. So it was really flattering to be invited onto the podcast, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So I'll definitely invite you back, and so just wanted to say thank you. Happy to have you on. You've inspired me to go to. Sunday's hit to be fit day at the campus with Michelle Krause, who will make me feel very, very out of shape when I go out there. <laughs> Cardio cool. tennis is my favorite way to play. And so I'll be out there on Sunday getting a little exercise in myself. But of course, just want to thank you for all you do and um, appreciate you being on the pod today. And I'm sure you'll be back. And don't forget, for those of you out there, check out the special edition a Florida Tennis Magazine for July and August for the commemorative 75th anniversary uh, awesome. publication. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. You too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Thanks. Matt. You too. Thanks. That's all for this episode of USTA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. I hope you enjoyed the topic. Please check our social media channels for more ways to engage with USTA Florida during our 75th anniversary year. And for more upcoming topics, dates, and episodes of the pod, visit USTAFlorida.com slash here to serve.